Well of Loneliness by Radcliffe Hall, Chapter 1. Not very far from Upton on Severn, between it, in fact, and Malvern Hills, stands the country seat of the Gordon of Bramley, well timbered, well cottage, well fenced, well watered, having in this latter respect a stream that forks in exactly the right position to feed two large lakes in the grounds. The house itself is of Georgian bread wreck, with charming circular windows near the roof. It has dignity and pride without ostentation, self-assuredness without arrogance, repose without inertia, and a gentle aloofness that, to those who know its spirit, but adds to its value as a home. It is indeed like certain lovely women, who now old belong to a bygone generation, women who in their youth were passionate, but seemingly difficult to win, but when won, or fulfilling. They are passing away, but their homesteads remain, and such a homestead is Morton. To Morton Hall came the Lady Anne Gordon. As a bride of just over twenty, she was lovely, as only an Irish woman can be, having that in her bearing that betokened quiet pride, having that in her eye that betokened great longing, having that in her body that betokened happy promise. The archetype of the perfect woman whom creating God has found good. Sir Philip had met her away in country Clare, Anna Molly, this slim virgin thing, all chastity, and his weariness had flown to her bosom, as a spent bird will fly to its nest. As indeed such a bird had once flown to her, she told him, taking refuge from the perils of a storm. Sir Philip was a tall man, and exceedingly well favoured, but his charms lay less in features than in a certain wild expression a tolerant expression that might almost be called noble yet gallant in his deep set hazel eyes his chin which was firm was very slightly cleft his forehead intellectual his hair tinged with auburn his wide nostril nose was indicative of temper but his lips were well moulded and sensitive and ardent they revealed him as a dreamer and a lover Twenty-nine, when they had married, he had sown no few wild oats, yet Anna's true instinct made her trust him completely. Her guardians had disliked him, opposed the engagement, but in the end she had had her own way, and as things turned out, her choice had been happy, for Selden had two people loved more than they did. They loved with an ardent, undiminished by time, as they ripened, so their love ripened within them. So Philip never knew how much he longed for a son until, some ten years after marriage, his wife conceived a child. Then he knew that this thing meant complete fulfillment, the fulfillment of which they had both been waiting. When she told him, he could not find words for expressions, and must just turn and weep on her shoulder. It never seemed to cross his mind for a moment that Anna might very well give him a daughter. He saw her only as mother of sons, nor could her warning disturb him. He christened the unborn infant Stephen, because he admired the pluck of the saint. He was not a religious man by instinct, being perhaps too much of a student, but he read the Bible for its fine literature, and Stephen had gripped his imagination. Thus he often discussed the future of their child. I think I shall put Stephen down for Harrow, or I'd rather like Stephen to finish abroad. It widens one's outlook. And listening to him, Anna also grew convinced. His certainty wore down her vague misgivings, and she saw herself playing with this little Stephen in the nursery, in the garden, in the sweet-smelling meadows. And himself, the lovely young man, she would say, thinking of the soft iris speak of her presence. And himself, with the light of the stars in his eyes, and the courage of a lion in his heart. Then the child stirred within her, she would think it stirred strongly because of the gallant male creature she was hiding. Then her spirits grew large with a mighty new courage, because his own child would be born. She would sit with her needlework, dropped on her knees while her eyes turned away to the long line of the hills that stretched beyond the seven valleys.
From her favourite seat underneath an old cedar, she would see these Marvin hills in their beauty, and their swelling slopes seemed to hold a new meaning. They were like pregnant women, full bosom, courageous, great green girdled mothers of splendid sons. Thus, through all those summer months, she sat and watched the hills, and Sir Philip would sit with her. They would sit hand in hand, and because she felt grateful, she gave much to the poor. And Sir Philip went to church, which was seldom his custom. And the vicar came to dinner, and just towards the end, many matrons called to give good advice to Anna. But man proposes, God disposes, and so it happened that on Christmas Eve, Anne Gordon was the deliverer of a daughter, a narrow-hipped, wide-shouldered little tadpole of a baby that yelled and yelled for three hours without ceasing, as though outraged to find itself ejected into life. Anne Gordon held her child to her breast, but she grieved while it drank because of her man who had longed so much for a son and seeing her grief sir philip hid his chagrin and fondled the baby and examined its fingers what a hand he would say why it's actually got nails on it all its ten fingers little perfect pink nails then anna would dry her tears and caress it kissing the tiny hands he insisted on calling the infant Stephen. Nay more, he would have it baptized that name. We've called her Stephen so long, he told Anna, that I really can't see why we shouldn't go on. Anna felt doubtful, but Sir Philip was stubborn, as he could be at times over whims. The vicar said it was rather unusual, so to mollify him they must add female names. The child was baptized in the village church as Stephen, Mary, Olivia, Gertrude, and she throve, seeming strong, and when her hair grew, it was seen to be auburn like Sir Philip's. There was also a tiny cleft in her chin, so small just at first that it looked like a shadow, and after a while, then, when her eyes lost the blurriness that is proper to puppies and other young things, Anna saw that her eyes were going to be hazel, and thought that their expression was her father's. On the whole, she was quite a well-behaved baby, owing, no doubt, to a fine constitution. Beyond this first energetic protest at birth, she had done very little howling. It was happy to have the baby at Molson, and the old house seemed to become more mellow as the child, growing fast now and learning to walk, staggered or stumbled or sprawled on the floor that had long known the ways of children. Sir Philip would come home all muddy from hunting and would rush into the nursery before putting off his boots. Then down he would go on his hands and his knees while Stephen clambered on his back. Sir Philip pretended to be well corned up, bucking and jumping and kicking wildly so that Stephen must cling to his hair collar and thump him with a hard low arrogant fist. Anna, attracted by the outlandish hubbub, would find them and would point to the mud on the carpet. She would say, Now Philip, now Stephen, that's enough. It's time for your tea. As though both of them were children. Then Sir Philip would reach up and disentangle Stephen, after which he would kiss Stephen's mother. The son that they had waited for seemed longer coming. He had not arrived when Stephen was seven nor had Anna produced other female offspring, thus to even remain cock of their roost. It is doubtful if any only child is to be envied, for the only child is bound to become introspective, having no one of its own ilk to whom it confides. It is apt to confide in itself. It cannot be said that at seven years old the mind is beset by serious problems, but nevertheless it already grouping may already be subject to small fits of dejection, may already be struggling to get a grip on life, on the limited life of its surroundings. At seven there are miniature loves and hatreds, which however loom large and are extremely disconcerting. They may even be present a dim sense of frustration, and Stephen was often conscious of this sense, though she could not have put it into words. 
to cope with it, however, she would give way at times to sudden fits of hot temper, working herself up over everyday trifles that usually left her cold. It relieved her to stamp and then burst into tears at the first sight of her position. After such outbursts, she would feel much more cheerful, would find it almost easy to be docile and obedient. In some vulgar, childish way, she had hit back at life, and this fact had restored her self-respect. Anna would send for her turbulent offspring and would say, Stephen, darling, mother's not really cross. Tell mother what's making you give way to these tempers. She promises to try and understand if you tell her. But her eyes would look cold, though her voice might be gentle, and her hands, when it fumbled, would be tentative, unwilling. The hand would be mere aching an effort to fondle, and Stephen would be conscious of that effort. Then looking up at the calm, lovely face, Stephen would be filled with a sudden contrition, with a sudden deep sense of her own shortcomings. She would long to blurt all this out to her mother, yet would stand there tongue-tied, saying nothing at all, for these two were strangely shy with each other. It was almost grotesque, this shyness of theirs, as existing between mother and child. Hannah would feel it, and though her Stephen, young as she was, would become conscious of it, and through her Stephen, young as she was, would become conscious of it, so that they held a little aloof when they should have been drawing together. Stephen, actually responsive to beauty, would be dimly longing to feel expressions for a feeling almost amounting to worship that her mother's face had awakened. But Anna, looking gravely at her daughter, noting the plentiful auburn hair, brave hazel eyes that were so like her father's, as indeed were the child's whole expression and the bearing, would be filled with a sudden antagonism that came very near to anger. She would awake at night and ponder this thing, scolding herself in an access of contrition, accusing herself of hardness of spirit, of being an unnatural mother. Sometimes she would shed slow, miserable tears, remembering the inarticulate Stephen. She would think, they ought to be proud of the likeness, proud and happy, glad when I see it. Then back would come flooding the queer antagonism that amounted almost to anger. It would seem to Anne that she must be going mad, for this likeness to her husband would strike her as an outrage, as though the poor and innocent seven-year-old Stephen were in some way a character of Sir Philip, a blemish unworthy, maimed reproduction, yet she knew that the child was handsome, but now there were times when the child's soft flesh would be almost distasteful to her, when she hated the way Stephen moved or stood still, hated the certain largeness about her, a certain crude lack of grace in her movements, a certain unconscious difference. Then the mother's mind would slip back to the days when this creature had clung to her breast, forcing her to love it by its own utter weakness, and at this thought her eyes must fill again, for she came of a race of devoted mothers. The thing has crept on her like a foe in the dark. It had been slow, insidious, deadly. It had waxed strong, as Stephen herself had waxed strong, being part in some way of Stephen. Restlessly tossing from side to side, Anna Gordon would pray for enlightenment and guidance, would pray that her husband might never suspect her feelings toward his child. Although she was and had been, he knew. In all the world, she had no other secret save this one most unnatural and monstrous injustice that was stronger than her will to destroy it. And Sir Philip loved Stephen. He idolized her. It was almost as though he divined by instinct that his daughter was being secretly defrauded, was bearing some unmerited burden. He never spoke to his wife of these things, yet watching them together, she grew daily more certain that his love for the child held an element in it that was closely akin to pity.